it's unlikely that you can ever get too much of Florence. It has so many riches to offer you. We have presented a whole series of programs on Florence to you with World Traveler, and we'll continue presenting new programs about this city because there is just a lot here to show you. There's the outdoor street market of San Lorenzo, so be sure to look for this place and you'll have lots of fun walking through this very active market of San Lorenzo. You can do a little bargaining here at the sidewalk stalls. You might get them down in price 10%, maybe 20% if you're buying in volume. Terrific place to buy silk scarves and silk ties and of course leather goods. Florence is famous for leather jackets and wallets and shoes. Streets such as this on Via della Vigna Nuova are lined with fancy boutiques. Here you'll find headquarters shops of such fashion lines as Armani and Beltrami, Gucci, Ferragamo, and they're all here. They're all lined up waiting to take your money. You can buy purses and shoes, belts, jewelry and accessories to your heart's content. The Academia is one museum to keep high on your must-visit list while you're in Florence. Here's our Hawaii Geographic Society group entering one of the most important museums in the world, lined with statues by Michelangelo. Here you see one of the slaves. These were carved by Michelangelo for the tomb of Pope Julius II that was never actually finished the way he hoped it would be. So that gives us a good chance to see it right here in Florence at the Academia. But the most important statue, of course, in the collection, if not in the world, is David. Michelangelo's great masterpiece. It's about 19 feet tall, and he carved this at the youthful age of 29. This established Michelangelo as the foremost sculptor of his day. It truly has a magnificent home here at the Academia. All lines are drawn to the statue. It's in a cupola niche with other statues around it, including the late Pietà, another of Michelangelo's great masterpieces. And there's a wide collection of paintings here as well. You'll find works here by Ghirlandaio, by Botticelli, Lippi, Bartolomeo, and here Pacino di Bonaguida's Tree of Life from 1310. This is a prominent painting among the collection of Byzantine works which date to the late 13th and early 14th century. There's a great deal of religious art from this era. The Academia was founded in 1563 and it was the first art school in Europe. It was established to teach the techniques of drawing and painting and sculpture and the works of art were gathered here with the aim of providing students with materials to study and to copy. So it's been in existence for over 400 years. Again, the masterpiece and the focal point of the entire collection, for which it's most famous, is Michelangelo's David. But don't overlook the other artworks that are housed under the roof along with this great piece. Too many tourists just come here to see the David and then they leave and they walk right past all these other important paintings and other statues by Michelangelo without even seeing them. And just as there are other artworks in the Academia, there's other copies of David in town. There's two other major copies, full-size reproductions of the David. You'll find one of them out front of the Palazzo Vecchio at the Piazza della Signoria. You see it here. This is a copy that was created about 100 years ago. And this is where the actual original David stood for nearly 300 years. It was created to stand in that place in front of the main city hall. There's another copy in bronze up on Piazza Michelangelo, which also gives you a fantastic view of the city. It's worth a taxi ride up here, or you can take a public bus, and it'll take you up here to see this full-sized replica of David in bronze. And from the piazza you have a fantastic view of the city down below. This is one of the best vantage points to view the city and the River Arno. You'll see the bridges crossing the Arno there. So we bring our Hawaii Geographic Society group up here to enjoy the view and take a group photo. We've been traveling together from Rome to Florence and we have quite a ways to go on our tour yet. We're heading for Venice and getting our cameras back here from the group photo. 
on up to Lucerne, Switzerland, and to Paris, and eventually to London to complete our tour. And certainly Florence is one of those highlights that we'll never forget. It's an awesome experience to see all the monuments lined up this way, and you can zoom in for a nice view of the Ponte Vecchio crossing the Arno. Another great spot from which to see the city is the top of Giotto's bell tower that stands right here in front of the Duomo. You can also climb to the top of the dome itself. There's a public gallery from which you can see the city down below. It's only about 400 steps to get up there, so let's go, let's give it a try and climb up Giotto's bell tower and have a look down on the rooftops of Florence. Huff and puff your way up. You even have to pay to get in there. It costs about $3 to walk up the staircase. And the payoff is worth it. You get to the top and you have an unparalleled view of one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The Campanile del Duomo is 276 feet tall. It was completed in 1348 which makes it nearly 100 years older than the dome next door that was completed by Brunelleschi. And you can step right outside on the parapet to get a clear, unobstructed view of the city. It's called Giotto's Tower, but he actually died just as construction began. So it was completed by another great architect called Andrea Pisano. View of San Lorenzo Church, you can see Palazzo Vecchio, and you can spot many of the landmarks of the city, including the Church of Santa Croce, where we began our program today. We'll be starting in the Pitti Palace, originally built in 1457. The neighborhood of the Pitti is in the Ultrarno, just across the river. The art galleries inside the Pitti display the most perfect integration of sculpture, architecture, and paintings and overall decor that you will find in any museum in the world. This is probably the most spectacular Renaissance palace ever constructed and the artworks here were collected by the Medici family who lived in the palace back in the 16th and 17th century. They were the wealthiest family in the wealthiest city in the world at the time. The Medicis were the great banking dynasty and they had a great taste for art. So they assembled some of the finest paintings by Raphael and Titian and Tintoretto, Giorgione, Velazquez, Andrea del Sarto, and above all, a great collection of 16th and 17th century Florentine painters, such as Cigoli and Carlo Dolci and Santi di Tito. This superb collection of artworks from the Renaissance and the Baroque was put together by the Medici during the 17th and 18th centuries when they created this Palatine Gallery. And altogether it forms an astonishing and overwhelming collection of fine arts. There's an homage here to the artistic process in this marble-hewn statue of a marble sculptor. Your eyes will be continually drawn up to the ceiling, to the heavens as it were, in a series of frescoed murals painted by Pietro da Cortona. Despite the great beauty of each individual piece, such as Raphael's Tondo of the Madonna, your eyes will be continually drawn skyward to Cortona's five great masterpieces that represent the allegorical education of the young Medici prince. In one room, he learns about love and wisdom. In the next room, he learns about war from the god Apollo, followed by lessons in leadership from Jupiter. Finally, Saturn welcomes him to Mount Olympus. A vast landscape by Rubens and many other great masterpieces will just vie for your attention. But once again, you'll come back to the ceiling. Cortona not only painted the frescoes, he also did all the sculpture that's in the ceiling. All of the stucco work and the gilded, painted eaves and the architecture of the ceiling was done by this great Renaissance master, Pietro da Cortona. He was also an architect who designed buildings and churches and smaller palaces, particularly in Rome during the mid-17th century. Rubens did a portrait of Isabella Eugenia dressed as a nun. Titian presents us a sensual and naked portrait of Mary Magdalene. 
His portrait work shows some of the subtle and deft influence of Leonardo da Vinci, who was also active in Florence at this time, as was Michelangelo, who inspired this sculpture with one of his lost paintings. Thus, all the artistic elements of the Renaissance come together here in the Pitti Palace in Florence. We see many allegories here of struggle and conquest, which reflect the turbulent political times. This was a period that enjoyed a great appreciation for the fine arts. We see here another homage to the painter, to the process of painting in this beautiful marble statue in the middle of a gallery. But it was also a time of warfare and competition between Florence and the other rival city-states during the 16th and 17th century. After the Medici dynasty, the palace continued to be the residence of the leaders of Florence, right on up through the early 19th century, when it was finally opened as a public museum. Napoleon actually visited the palace and had this statue by Canova commissioned of the Italian Venus because he wanted to take the original back to Paris with him to put it in the Louvre. Here is the royal bathroom. They were certainly not lacking in any of the creature comforts. There are a total of eight museums inside the Pitti Palace, including the private apartments of the Medici. There's also a silver museum, and there's a modern art museum, and there are some beautifully decorated rooms. So all in all, you can spend half a day at least inside the Pitti Palace. And then when you're done, have a look around on the outside because it too is a work of art. The side wings were added by Amanati as the palace grew over a number of centuries to hold 1,000 rooms. The Boboli Gardens is the backyard of the Pitti Palace. When you're the richest family in the known world, this is the view you can enjoy also. The Boboli Gardens are open to the public on a daily basis. It was originally the stone quarry that was the source of building materials for the palace.